What I'm going to talk about it is the connections among flood, water vapor, long-term climate change, and the GASS measurements. You might wonder, how does this have anything to do with the UNAVICO workshop? Especially the theme of the workshop is about use of the GPS data for studying natural hazard. Let's look at the natural hazard. This shows you the spatial and temporal scales of the 16 selected natural hazard in um, Okay, uh, in um, 16 hazards in five groups, and those are the groups. And let's look at the flood. Flood is one of the hydrological hazards, uh, flood and drought. And the floods covers, uh, in terms of the spatial coverage, uh, from very uh, local, uh, local flat, uh, flash flood to major regional flood. And then if you look at the temporal scale, it all the way from several days to even months. And then if you look at the long-term climate change, normally people don't think long-term climate, climate change is a natural hazard. It is a natural hazard. It's over here. It's one of the atmospheric process. And then you wonder, where is the water vapor? Water vapor is involved in all aspects of the atmospheric hazards, okay? So that's why you see how this everything is connected. And that's not all the story. The main, I think the most important thing is how all of those natural hazards are connected. The one of the things is look at the hydrological, especially the flood. The flood is primarily triggered by atmospheric and geophysical process here and here. And in the meantime, flood can trigger other hazards, such as a shallow earth process and geophysical process, okay? So you see the, the huge connections between flood and other hazards. And if we look at uh, long-term climate change, this is divided uh, as uh, extreme um, hot temperature and cold temperature. That contributed to can trigger the flood. And uh, in the meantime, it, um, it's primarily um, triggered by the astrogenic effect and the other things like wildfires, uh, wildfires and volcanoes. In the meantime, it can trigger lots of things, almost everything in this plot. So what I'm going to do in this talk is connect those four things, okay? And most specifically, what I'm going to talk about is the water vapor characteristics during the 2013 Colorado flood, and then move on to some prior studies and our preliminary studies to link long-term climate change, water vapor, and flooding together. And in the end, I will call for um, kind of a potential collaborations from this community to use ground-based GPS uh, for our new New York State Masonet. That's where our work, because this is a completely new network. It's a very exciting opportunity. Okay, um, the first part, uh, I want to um, acknowledge my former student, Hannah Hewson. Uh, she did this work with me for her master thesis. So um, all credits go to her. And give you an overview of the 2013 cloud of flood. Um, a lot of people from UNAVICO or from this region, you know this event very well. It, it happened uh, in during um, middle of September, from September 8th to 15th. Uh, it had a continuous precipitation from uh, 9th to 16th. The heaviest precipitation occurred in the uh, 11th, uh, 12th and 11th and 12th 
This is time series of the precipitation. And here is a map of the total precipitation for that whole event. For the whole event, it, it accumulated 16 inch of the rain, rainfall. Um, compare that annual average of the 20 inch of the rainfall in this region. That means one week you almost accumulate your whole year of the rainfall. And in terms of the impact, uh, and a, um, claimed eight lives and the cost of over two, million, two billion in economic damage. So what we want to do is use ground-based uh, GPS-derived water vapor data to study water vapor, uh, um, water vapor characteristics. You wonder is why do you need the GPS data? If you compare the SUMINET GPS network with the radio sound network, you will see the much dense uh, uh, stations for, from the GPS. And in the meantime, for temporary sampling, uh, GPS can be 30 minutes to two hourly, but radio sound is just twice daily, right? And also GPS is available under all weather conditions. So the aim of this project is to examine the, the role of the water vapor in extreme precipitation. So we need uh, the water vapor data with high spatial and temporal resolution and coverage. Uh, here just to show you the time series of the um, uh, principal water vapor during that period of time, the black line is from the GPS uh, uh, and the red line is from the radio sound. The radio sound can capture the large scale variability by the details cannot be shown from the twice daily radio sound data. We will look at uh, the whole variability from three ways. Uh, first uh, is to look at uh, the time series during the event, uh, then look at uh, compare the climatology, then compare the uh, PDF of the water vapor. Okay, so first of all, we need to combine uh, the GPS PW data from six stations in this area into this 10 year climatology of two hourly PW data because every station was only available for a period of time. And uh, so we did a lot of, uh, Hannah did a lot of work to combine, match them spatially and temporally, created this climatology. Uh, so let's look at zoom in for one month of data from August 28th to September 28th. So before the flood, what you see is high water vapor amount. That's extension of the monsoon, uh, monsoon water vapor um, from the late August to early September. This is above normal condition. Then you have the flooding event. Afterwards, the water vapor uh, decreases dramatically, gets back to your uh, normal seasonal variability, okay? And then if you compare that, just during that event, uh, here is your water vapor amount, here's your precipitation. When it started, the water vapor increased dramatically from below two standard deviation of the um, the seasonal mean to above three standard deviation. And then the whole water vapor holds on there and just keep it constant during the event. Afterwards, it drops the down, right? During this event, this leveled up of the level of the water vapor is due to the atmosphere was totally saturated. So it doesn't change at all. Um, so, um, how does this water vapor feature compare with the climatology? What I show here is seasonal variability of the uh, uh, PW in the border area. Uh, the black, uh, the blue, and the red is the 40 year or 10 year climatology from the radio sun and the GPS. Then the black line is the September of 2013. So, and then I also show 95 and 99 percentile. Here's the September of the 2013. It's 30% above climatology and it's above 99 percentile of the water vapor. You see how much water vapor is there for this event. So then next thing is we look at uh, the PDF uh, of the PW. And Forrest et al. 2006, what they conclude is for PW, that this PDF uh, has three types. Uh, 
the log normal, reverse log normal, if you combine those two, you will get three types of bimodal distribution. So what we want to look at is uh, the climatology of the PDF, PWPDF and 2013, uh, 2013 PWF. Here is the September PDF from 10 years of the data, all of the different colors, and then the black line is your September 2013. So normally it's the log normal distribution, right? And the 2013, you get this bimodal distribution, totally different from all of the other years, right? Uh, how did you get this? That's a combination of uh, um, water vapor before, the flood, uh, before and during the flood and afterwards. The blue area is after the flood distribution. The green area is before the, uh, before, uh, green area is before and during the flood. You combine those two together, you get the bimodal distribution, right? So then the next most important question is where did this water vapor come from, right? That's really tell us why this flood happened. And just to show you the summary of the synoptic conditions for this event. And first of all, in the tropic uh, Pacific and over Gulf of Mexico, you get above normal sea surface temperature. What that means, you get more water vapor available in the atmosphere. And then in terms of dynamics, uh, you have a blocking ridge in the area in the beginning. And then during the event, uh, there are two things uh, formed, cutoff low in the west side and subtropic at anticyclone in the east side. So how do all of those things play a role in the water vapor transport and sustain the water vapor during the flood? What we did is to look at the 500 millibar geopotential height and water vapor flux and water vapor anomaly from the SUMINET data. And so for uh, five times uh, during this event. So let's first look at the dynamics in terms of geopotential height. This is what, what I said is the range, range in the in the beginning, and then you get this cut, low, a cut off low and the uh, east uh, part of the anticyclone, tropical at anticyclone. And then later on, this cut, low, uh, cut off low stays there. And so this kind of dynamics uh, cause the water vapor transport. In the beginning, the water vapor is mainly coming from the tropical Pacific. Then later on, when you have those two things, uh, and you get the water vapor from both the Pacific and Gulf of the Mexico. They converge to the Colorado region. And then later on, because of the disappear of the Aten cyclone, you only get the water vapor from the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And the water vapor transport uh, corresponds very well with your uh, PW anomaly. So that's how the dynamics plays a role in the water vapor system sustainability during the event. Okay, so let me move on to the next topics that connect those three things, long-term climate change, flooding, and water vapor. Two things is there are uh, quite a few of studies that have show, are showing the, when the climate is getting warm and you get the increase in the extreme precipitation dense, uh, intensity. So the question, big question mark is how, what caused this, right? The water vapor would be one of the suspects. And the second thing I want to connect is, based on the 2013 cloud of flood, we saw this water vapor characteristics. Let's look at water vapor characteristics during different climate period and for the future climate. How can we see anything about the flooding in the warmer climate? How much time do I have? Okay, I will go quickly. Here to show you one example of the intensity of the heavy precipitation, 99.9 percentile, 99, 90 percentile. The variability with the temperature, the point is at temperature below 10 C, what you see is this ratio follows the closest Clapham equation, 7% per 
degree increasing. And then at warmer temperature, it's much higher than Clausius Clapham equation. So the question is, uh, what caused this part? There are quite a few of studies uh, in terms of the deep convection, the transitions from shallow convection to deep convection, and the water vapor. This is the one study using the GeoNet uh, uh, very dense over 1,200 uh, stations in Japan to study the PW variability with the surface air temperature. However, what they found is for the heavy precipitation events, uh, at cold temperature, you get above uh, classic Clapham uh, ratio. But at high temperature, you follow that 7% per Kelvin. So this cannot explain your uh, precipitation variability with the air temperature. What they conclude is what's, main, what's the primary reason is up air temperature, up air water vapor. Remember, PW is primarily controlled by low level water vapor. Okay. So um, let me move to the last one. It's just uh, looking at these characteristics. So the question what we have is, can we compare the PDF for different climate period in the past to see how they are different? And then also compare the future predicted climate change. What does that mean for the future extreme event? And here is global, global mean temperature over the land and over the ocean. Over the land, we all know the, um, the, the global warming hiatus starting from 1999 and it's kind of ending around 2000, uh, 2010 here. So you see the warming kind of stopped and afterwards the warming started again. So what I want to look at is PDF or PW during those two period. My group have, uh, has created a long-term two hourly PW data from 1995 to 2016, over 20, 20 years of the data. So here just uh, the PDF for before 2010, the black line and the red line is after 2010. For all of those four stations, what you see is after 2010, the PW is much higher. It's not just higher, the PDF, the, the shape of the PDF also changed for some stations. Like for this one, change from the log normal to reverse log normal for this station and it changed from the normal distribution to bimodal distribution. And if just to look at two of the stations, the long-term water vapor variability in Beijing and in one of the Holland station, it's very large long-term increasing of the PW, okay? So how about the future climate change? Um, uh, Gicola Roma, she did a study, it's very similar to what I just showed is to compare the climatology of PW in Boulder area with the floody vat, the red area. So what you see is much wet conditions during the flood. And then she extended this uh, to a climate simulation for 100 years of the data. What she showed here is the black is first 20 years of uh, basically 2000s to 2025. And then the last 25 years, uh, 2070. Uh, 2075 to 20, 2100. So what she uh, uh, concluded is because of the PDF shift that implies in the future we might get more of those flooding events. Okay, so you can argue about this validity of this, but this is just one way to show. And very quickly, call for your collaboration. The New York State Masonet, we are going to completely operational ne next week. This is 180 stations, including three, four networks, 126 standard networks measures uh, standard meteorology variables with surf soil moisture and soil temperature at three levels 
every site has a camera and 24 seven, and we also have snow depth measurement at every site. And now we have three sub networks. Profile network is the first time give you the 3D, sub, uh, 3D mesonet to measure the, uh, it includes the um, wind ladder, micro radiometer, and all sky images. And then we also have a, a sub-network, snow network to measure snow water equipment. And we also have a flux network to measure all components of the surface energy budget. However, one of the primary motivation for this network uh, is about uh, flooding events in the northeast region. And if you look at that, besides the 17 profile network, we don't have any water vapor, atmosphere water vapor information. In the beginning, five years ago, when we started this project, I strongly advocate every site should have a GPS receiver, but I was not strong enough to get all of that. And so what I want to call is, since we already have all of the infrastructure and power communication and platform, and if this community is interested in, that would be great to have that. The private studies have shown how important the integrated water vapor for um, forecasting of the extreme events. So this is what we have the GPS uh, stations in New York right now. So I will leave you with the summary. The point I want to make is all of those things connected together and ground-based GPS derived water vapor plays a very important role to look at the extreme events or you want to call natural hazards. That's all I have. Thank you very much. So we have uh, time for a couple questions, comments, suggestions. Yeah, if, if I understood your, your map correctly, you showed that the um, anomalous precipitable water was spread over a fairly broad region of the, of the high plains, and yet the, the unusual storm event was quite localized. And so, what explains that, and in particular in the future, if, if that were to occur again, could you forecast where the anomalous rainfall would actually occur? Yeah, um, regarding that map of the PW anomaly, um, you have to take it into two things, uh, kind of uncertainty. One says we don't have that dense of the GPS network, so we did kind of grading things. If you look at the station, we might have a hole. That's why you see the big areas rather than concentrated area. And then another thing is regarding I think it's not just a water vapor. It's also the dynamics plays a very important role in terms of, of forecasting those events. Even if you, the water vapor is a necessary condition to sustain that, to continue to support that, uh, su supply that water vapor, you have to have the dynamic. 